and, and will the city be able to compete effectively with the suburbs as we move forward? I'd be asking that question if I were in your seat. The answer is, is a definite yes. And let me, uh, let me show you some maps to do that. Um, can you see these in the back? Um, I'll go these back and forth. One is really the negative of the other. So we have these high median household incomes out. And we have great population density in. Let me uh, show this one other way. Um, we have software that does uh, market optimization, and what we do is we put uh, the computer puts a grid in the in this map on one mile apart spots. So if you think about all these dots a mile apart, it'll measure different drive times and char characteristics, whatever we want to look at. In this case, we're looking at population density and looking at how far people can get within a 15-minute drive time. And where there's the greatest overlap um, is the deepest red. So if you think about um, what this is doing is if you live over here on the west side of town, it looks at how far you can get in 15 minutes in any direction. And as you start measuring that for every person in the city across this grid, it starts to, to accumulate that. And the deepest red means that people can get to that place the best. So the greatest access to our city from population density is really the, the heart of our city. Uh, that's a combination of two things. We have that density that I showed you. And we also have a great grid street network. And <coughs> the highways haven't completely uh, changed that. So if you want to get around, this is the way people get around. That's the access. So now, if I'm sitting in your chair, I'm asking, OK, so we have all these middle-income people in the middle of the city that can do this. What's that going to do to developers? Well, the reality is um, we can look at this a different way. This is taking this same grid, but now looking at household expenditures. So I live roughly there. I probably, uh, I don't know, household expenditures are $40,000 in my household. The software knows what it is. I don't. Um, it's measuring <clears throat> how far I can get in 15 minutes. Roxanne lives downtown, so it, it, it's taking her expenditures and saying how far can she get in 15 minutes. And as you overlay all of that on top of each other, you can see that the people that are spending money in our city or in our community, and this is across the entire map, can get to the core of our city better than any place else. So we have the most accessible part of the city in the very heart of our city. So there's a tremendous market opportunity here. Um, we did this for another client, so it's, uh, it's not quite the same story, but I thought it would be illustrative. We um, <clears throat> put a dot um, basically on the river, uh, on the suspension bridge, and measured a five-mile ring around that. So if you think about where that would reach, it gets uh, to the edge of Price Hill, it gets up to Clifton, it gets to the edge of Mount Adams, <clears throat> and then it goes down into Kentucky, of course. And inside that five-mile ring, we measure how much demand, and, and that's the total. So there was $4.2 billion of consumer demand for retail. <coughs> the supply within that <coughs> five-mile ring is $3.2 billion. This is one year, one year. So there's a billion dollars of unmet demand within that five-mile ring. And that doesn't even take into account the fact that there are people that live outside of that ring that can get there and shop. So there is this phenomenal opportunity for, for de there's demand for, uh, for all types of things within the middle of our city. So uh, the data depict this great opportunity. Again, tripling our population, tripling the value of our real estate, uh, creating enough asset and financial capacity within our city to invest and create whatever each of you in your neighborhoods dreams about. But how do we make this happen? 
I mean, it's it, it's great to say we've got we've got these trends, but how do we make it happen? The answer is is to make Cincinnati matter by creating walkable neighborhoods through walkable urbanity. Now, form-based codes are a <clears throat> tremendous lever in all of this. It's really the uh, probably the most powerful public-private partnership at a low cost that there is. The public-private partnership is you have the public sector lending the zoning approval to the property owners and the development community in a way that creates the place that matters that allows for all of this to be unlocked. It's very, very powerful and very, very important, and it's it's critical that this move forward the way that it does. Now, we um, actually have four um, quantitative, fairly quantitative dimensions to how we define walkable urbanity, and we borrowed this from Christopher Leinberger at the uh, Brookings Institution because th we think he's pretty smart. Um, and let me caveat this, that these four quantitative pieces are not part of form-based codes. So this is nothing to do with form-based codes. So if this is um, controversial, this has nothing to do with Roxanne's initiative. Uh, this is all about our point of view on how to make place matter and create walkable neighborhoods. So everybody understand that caveat? This is not... Don't blame her. Where do you see it on YouTube, though? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first dimension is that um, the homes within a walkable neighborhood, within walkable urbanity, have to be within walking distance of work or transit that takes you to work. Now, that gives you two choices. You either need to have a place to work in that community, whether that's offices or the type of workspace that, um, that, that is comparable to offices, or you have to be able to walk to transit to get you to work. So right now, what do we have? We have a bus system. Um, most Midwestern cities are transit starved. We're right now in that same position. Think about the great cities anywhere. They have multiple transit options. So we've got to have multiple transit options if we're going to meet this. Now, let me say for a minute, the streetcar is the place to start. Go back to the value creation in the real estate. We go from 16 billion to 48 billion, and we've created $32 billion of extra value in our communities. That can pay for a system of trans transit that will go to every neighborhood. We can have, we can have most anything. Um, so, we have to start somewhere, though, and the streetcar is a place to start. And all of this then leads to the opportunity to, uh, to go wherever the neighborhood is going to create a built environment where the value capture can ultimately pay for that investment. 